I don't know which one stepped onto mine. Um, but uh, yeah, we were told to switch, and uh, next thing you know, there was this loud explosion, the ground shook. And silhouetted in the, in the windows are three Marines, and you just know right away. We were just Marines. We weren't the walking dead. We, we were just Marines, and it just happened, you know, the young guys now go as the walking dead. That's why it was a nightmare. It was even worse, you know. I, I had it down in boot camp. I stayed out of the way, did what I was supposed to do, and, and then I came out of SOI and went to 1st Battalion 9th Marines with the Alpha Company. And then we ended up going to uh, Afghanistan. When we go out patrolling to the bazaar, we had this little boy. He'd always, uh, he'd always be outside like, selling shit in an egg crate to us, and uh, cigarettes, snacks, anything like that. And uh, he would be out there, and it'd be like 100 degrees. So I know that sand was hot because whenever I'd get out of the truck, it was boiling my feet, and I'm in boots. And uh, he'd be out there barefoot. And he was like five or six years old, and. Uh, Anytime he didn't make enough money because his parents would leave him out there until he had to make a quota and then he could finally go home. And uh, Taliban caught on that we were letting him in close because we were buying buying stuff from him. And they wanted to pit, they wanted to plant like a fake IED in the wadi because they know they know our procedures. They know what's going to happen when we find that stuff. We're going to cordon it off and wait for UED to come in and they disarm it or detonate it, whatever they do. I'm not a UED, but. Uh, he, uh, they approached him, and they were, uh, they were like, "We're gonna, we want you to put this SS on, and when you walk up, detonate, kill yourself, kill them." And I, I guess the kid, and he liked us so much because we were always, we were always nice to him. He refused to, and when uh, he refused to, they slit his throat and threw him into ditch, and we found him the next day, and. Uh, I think that's always ate me up the most because I felt responsible for him. Uh, yeah, we were told to switch, and uh, next thing you know, there was this loud explosion, the ground shook, and uh, I can hear somebody yelling my last name that I was dad, you know, and I was kind of like really, really surreal. And I realized it had to be him. So he died, the first sergeant died, and the radio man died, and I think there were 16 other casualties. And by the time uh, we had the helicopters and come back and then take them back, or take them out of the area, it was getting dark, and we had to have reinforcements come and stay with us that night. And uh, because of that event, uh, the next day is when I, you know, I, I just wanted, I wanted to hurt somebody. And when I saw something move off, you know, as we were marching through the jungle, I just opened up, shot burst of maybe 15 rounds, and didn't realize there was a little girl, a three-year-old on the inside. And uh, they grazed her head, and uh, we were told to just go back to base. The family from that village and the village, people followed us, yelling at us. And I just remember seeing the father with his daughter. And I was told just to let it go. My son's name is Lance Corporal Jordan C. Herter. April 22nd, 2008, Jordan from 1-9 and Jonathan Yale, Corporal Jonathan T. Yale from 2-8. They were transitioning out and 1-9 was just coming in to that um, Nasser in the Sophia district. And weapons company, this is platoon, they call themselves Wet 3. So Weapons Company 3rd Platoon was, was guarding this base. And Jordan and Jonathan just came on duty at 7.30 in the morning. And all of a sudden, a, a giant Mercedes tank truck just comes barreling in the serpentine Jersey barriers. And they can tell it, it's you know just gaining speed and not going to stop. So Jordan and Jonathan opened precise fire into the windshield, killing the driver. But he must have had a dead man switch or something in the truck still exploded, immediately taking Jordan's life. 
and Jonathan was dying, but it saved the lives of 33 Marines and over 50 Iraqi policemen and civilians at that compound who were sleeping. My husband is Sergeant Christopher Joseph Hirsch. We met when he was eight and I was 10. So he joined the Marine Corps on 9909 and went to Paris Island, graduated December 4th, 2009, and then went to California for his MOS schooling. And then we ended up in 1-9 at Camp Lejeune in June of 2010. Losing Christopher Grant was really hard because Chris worked on him for two hours before he passed. And I know that really ate Chris alive. And he lived with a lot of survivor's guilt with that. He's like, I, I'm there higher up. I should have gone. I should have gone. So Chris got out of the Marine Corps in July of 2014. And he got a job up in Raleigh as an IT guy. If you look out the outside of ours, we had two beautiful girls. We had a house. We had the cars. We had the boat. We had everything that the American dream was. But no one knew the darkness that was in our marriage that I tried to hide because I didn't want people to look down at Chris. I didn't want people to look at me as a failure because I couldn't get my husband the help that he needed. And it was, it was a struggle for about a year and a half when he got out of the Marine Corps. Five months later, I get the worst phone call of my life. He called me, I love you. I'm sorry I can't be the man you and the girls deserve, click. I called the police, they were there in two minutes. He was alive when the police officers got there. He was walking up to the door and heard the gun go off. When my husband went to Vietnam, we were dating. <laughs> and it was 1968. I didn't realize what he had gone through until we went to a graduation and they had firecrackers and my husband was on the ground. He never wanted to talk about Vietnam. He, didn't never, he never wanted to go camping. He, he said, I slept on the ground for 12, 13 months. I never want to go out in the woods. <laughs> he always had this thing in his head about he was on borrowed time. He shouldn't, he shouldn't have never came back. And I believe that is why what happened to him, it finally just, he could never let go. When John committed suicide, there's, there's no way of knowing that they're going to do this. There's just no way of knowing it. It just, we were married for 47 years and I thought I knew the man. <laughs> So we went to this place called the Street of No Joy, and uh, that's where I had my first firefight and blew up some hooches, and we saw some Vietnamese running up towards the village, and I, that was, I hadn't killed anybody at the time or anything, so I, I had my, the M79 grenade launcher, so I started to point, you know, just in case, because it's like four or five of them running towards the village. Somebody yelled real loud. Don't shoot, don't shoot. The friendlies are going towards the ville. So I put my M79 down and about, so they ran into the village. So then uh, we start walking towards the village and about 10, 15 minutes later, they opened up on us. And I don't know if those Vietnamese had anything to do with it or not. They were VC. And uh, so it's possible they, it, it was them, we don't know, but we blew, blew the hell out of that village. I must have shot about 15 or 20 M79 rounds blowing up hooches and stuff. And so the next day, we're crossing a river. PFC Keene stepped on a wire and the wire was connected to a, one of our grenades up on the tree and it fell down and it blew his brains out. I saw a lot of, a lot of combat, you know, 1-9 Alpha Company. We held case on for 77 days. We had no idea where we were going. And of course, I was 18 years old. To me, it, it didn't affect me that much. That's what I was trained for. But when you see it, it's a different world, you know? It's not like in the movies anymore, so it's very real. 
Lance Corporal Christopher uh, O. Grant uh, was killed in action by a suicide bomber. When that happened, I was actually, um, I was actually uh, getting, waiting, waiting briefing uh, to be a co become a driver because we were doing what's called mobile patrols, which is by vehicle, which is our MRAPs and MATVs, which are these big old armored vehicles. When I walked back to my room, I, I lay down in my rack, and the next thing I know, one of my guys who were also waiting for the same orders knocks on my door, tells me to sit down. And I'm like, for what? Like, well, I have to go to CP. He's like, yeah, I know, I know why you're going. You need to sit down. I'm like, okay. And he's like, it's, it's Grant, man. And I was like, what? He's like, it's Grant, he's, he's been killed. And to this day, you know, um, I struggle with the, with the guilt of that. Uh, you know, the fact that I didn't go, I wasn't, I wasn't myself going out there. Um, you know, because of, because I was getting taught how to, you know, drive a truck in, for uh, tactical purposes. Joshua had wanted to be a Marine since he was in second grade. We actually have a book that he wrote that he was going to be a lifelong Marine. He was going to retire a Marine after 30 years. Joshua was deployed uh, to Afghanistan shortly after boot camp. He actually was assigned to the 1-9 in Camp Lejeune. Came back from Afghanistan, then shortly after that went to Kuwait and they did a, a tour in Kuwait. Um, when he came back home, um, he was home for a short time and they decided they were going to send them back to Afghanistan. So that's when they went to Bridgeport for training. And um, actually the accident where he died was right before they were supposed to deploy to Afghanistan the second time. Joshua died knowing he was adored by his family. He was loved beyond belief. He was going to marry the woman of his dreams. So we were high school sweethearts. We started dating the summer of our sophomore year. Um, and then he went to the Marines right after high school and I went to college and so he proposed to me about a year after high school and then we got married in 2012. He was first to play to Afghanistan um, in 2011 and then again in 2013. He didn't, he didn't tell me anything when he was in Afghanistan, the second deployment. Um, he, I kind of realized like later how much he hid from me in the second deployment. I think he had a really hard time with the culture in Afghanistan as far as um, there's, there's children and you don't know if they're like just children or if they're like children that are gonna like throw rocks or throw whatever at you. And so he, um, I think he struggled a lot with feeling so distrustful. There, like looking back, there were things that I thought would go away or I thought would get better, but they just, just I guess where it was too much for him. And um, he had actually taken videos on his phone too at home before he left and said, I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to die. Come to find out he, he had driven to railroad tracks. He called the police himself. Um, he told them where he was and what he was about to do and then shut his phone off. He had taken his life before the police got there, um, and that was so. When they when they came, when the detective came to my door, he already, already knew, and he had uh, a letter for me. We were out of water. We were so you know we, it was hot. I mean it was very hot, and we would run out and grab. Uh, third platoon got run over, so we'd go out and grab bodies, or, you know, wounded and whatever. So we went out to grab this tall black guy, his name was Raglan, he was a machine gunner. And he had dust on his face, he looked dead. So we went to grab him and he opened up his eyes, he was playing dead. And we pulled him into the, and they were shooting it, they never hit us, the snipers never hit us. Pulled him in there, he was laughing and crying. He said, man, he said, they were drinking my water over me and they'd, they'd stick a bayonet by my head and I just froze and they would stick it. And then another one would come out. 
two or three, and they would do the same thing. After that, I was senior. I was a senior squad leader. I had all new replacements. And uh, I went to the chaplain. I said, Chaplain, you got to tell me something that I can tell these men because I don't want their souls to be on me because uh, we got a bad record here. And I, I knew I was going to die. I just didn't know when. So he said, boy, that, nobody's ever done that. So he said, you start coming around. So I did. I started coming around. Finally, I figured out I, I got this, you know. So we were at Conti Inn. We get 500 rounds a day sometimes, well, more than that. But it sounds like fiction, but it's true. And I went into the bunker, and I, took, I said, all of you take your helmets off. Put your rifles down. Y'all going to get saved now. So you repeat after me. And they did. They was about half scared of me anyway. And they prayed. And I said, now, your soul's not on me, you know. And uh, because of that, the chaplain went to Captain Ryan and said, hey, I want Ray to be my chaplain's assistant. I feel guilty because I did, I left, I became the chaplain's assistant. And now I'm hanging out with the Navy, corpsman and the hospital and whatever. So at Contian, in September, we were there and he came to the aid station because he had a little cut or something, I don't know. And when he went out, incoming came in and, and hit him and, uh, Lieutenant Christensen and Doc Smith were outside the hospital bunker. We brought him in. Him and I worked on Brian. Ripped his clothes off, he was spraying. He said, hey, Marine, who did you get? I said, well, I don't know. So I showed him my manila envelope. He said, oh my God. He looked at me, he says, you're a dead man. I said, whoa, wait a minute, what are you talking about? He says, nobody lives up from some of that outfit, you're all gonna die. February 26th, two days after my uh, 19th birthday, we were just, uh, we were dug in, nothing going on, nothing going on. We come down on this road, pretty easy hiking. It was a pretty nice road, uh, like a, a logging road. And we're just kind of milling around uh, by the log deck. I'm looking them over, I'm seeing how they're cut, you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested. All of a sudden, shoo, bam! I just, whoa, ho, ho, ho. zip, bam, zip, bam, do, 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 do. man, the whole, all hell breaks loose. And so I'm there by myself. I said, oh, no, this isn't good. And all of a sudden, I'm yelling, uh, turn my head uh, this way, I'm yelling, uh, bunker, bunker to my, get to my left, get to my left, everybody get to my left. Bam! Boy, they got me. Whew. I remember going flying backwards. And I said, ah, oh, jeez. And I got up to my knees, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck happened. I see my helmet laying there, a big old great gaping hole in it. And I said, oh, this can't be good. I said, man. So I'm trying to get my head together. I'm trying to wipe all the sweat out of my eyes because I can't really see. It's all red. I said, oh, man. I've been shot in the head. And they had thought that they got me, which they did, but I wasn't dead. So I crawled, crawled up there. As uh, fast as I could, fast as I could, and grabbed a grenade, let the spoon fly, and counted about three or four, and got it into the bunker. Oh, whoosh! But uh, I grabbed a rifle out of the uh, foxhole because I was going to take a souvenir home with me. Uh, that's the rifle that did shoot me. Lieutenant uh, caught up with me in uh, North Carolina, Cherry Point Naval Hospital in Camp Lejeune. He said, I've got something for you. So he was going on a med cruise. He had all these men in front of him and whatnot. So he brought that up. He says, remember this? I said, boy, do I? He presented it to me. So I got to bring it home. I thought that was uh, uh, pretty honorable of him, bringing that home and, and, and presented it to me. So there it hangs on my, uh, on my wall. Uh, that's, uh, it was quite an ordeal. And he was heading on, on the med cruise and uh, he had probably 300 men in, in formation down below him. And there's a guy I heard say, boy, who is that? You know, referring to me, he says, that was his sergeant in Vietnam. Really, you, you need the brotherhood. 
it it helps me a lot because I got guys I know talking to even these like Vietnam vets they understand you they've gone through the same thing they had to deal with the same stuff so you always got someone that is in your shoes because like no matter what like whatever era they know they know you're a one nine guy like they got your back I understand, you know, like I said, I isolate myself a lot, really. I isolate myself, and it's a problem. It's not, it's not good. It's not. But for me, what kills isolation for me is when I go ahead and I'm around Marines, no matter what generation. And I tell them also stop being dumb because you're not going to find what you're looking for in, in regular civilians. You're not. It doesn't matter if they're older Marines, younger Marines, or anything. You're not going to find anything better than a Marine or a corpsman in your life from this point on. It's, 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 it's been a long time coming, you know, as generations come, like this is, our, this generation of Marines, you know, my generation and everything like that, all the young ones, this is the generation of understanding. This is the generation of, you know, understanding that we are human beings no matter if you're a Marine or not. This is a generation that ex was willing to allow Marines to express and, and also provokes them to express these emotions. I was really nervous because you had these veterans that have this brotherhood. Uh, we were Marines, we went to boot camp, we did all this, and I was nervous to be here, one, without Chris, and two, I really don't have a lot of things in common with these. These men and women have been the best. They've given me hugs. For me to think that they were gonna treat me any different was ridiculous. It's been a really good experience, and I'm able to cry here, and talk to people about it, and they know because they've lost their brothers, they've lost their sons. One Nine has, every time I'm with One Niners, it's like I feel very good. It's like, I don't need medications. I don't, I've gone through the vet center where they try to throw a, a Air Force person, tell me, draw me a picture. So I told the vet center, you know what? I need a Marine that has walked through the jungles, climbed the same mountains, or, you know, whatever, like I did. I bond with people like that. I can't talk to somebody in the Air Force that never went into combat or anything like that. The guys that are out there, you know, contemplating anything, you know how it is. It's not easy out there. You always, there's always issues. Just reach out to somebody, you know, just reach out. You know, help help out and get help out your brother, um, because you know it, the transition from having everything there for you all the time to getting out and now you have to provide for yourself. It's it's mind-boggling, and you don't need to go through it alone. If you say uh, you're dealing with your PTSD <clears throat> by yourself, all alone in that whole world, that's a beautiful world, isn't it, buddy? <laughs> yeah. PTSD, those demons have you fooled, buddy. You don't have control, they do. They're working you over, buddy. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your family, you owe it to the world. Get with your buddies, because that's the only help you're gonna get, and that's the help you need. And it's there for you, it's there. We do it all the time, that's why we have these reunions. You can't do it by yourself, virtually impossible. I've been that route, I know. You cannot do it. Get it done, my guys.